So we have two awesome presenters for you tonight. Stacey Babish, right over here, <laughs> is a reading specialist and literacy coach at Greenville Elementary School. She's nationally board certified and one of the best in her field. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think you'll find her enthusiasm is contagious. Um, she's been with our county for 11 years, and she's been an educator for 15. Annie Hoppy is our other presenter tonight. She is the speech pathologist at Greenville Elementary School, and she also services the children at Head Start. Annie brings a wealth of knowledge and expertise to tonight's workshop. She's been with our county for 13 years as a, and a speech pathologist for 15. And she gets extra credit tonight because she's coming straight from Charlottesville, where she was presenting today for the VDOE on traumatic brain injury. So without further ado, I will introduce or let our presenters take over since that's who we came to see. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> if you get green on, you get extra credit. Right. Um, just wanted to give you guys a brief overview of what we're going to talk about, let you know the handouts are there if you haven't picked one up yet. Stacy and I are going to be kind of taking two pieces of this together. Um, the first part that Stacy's going to present is going to pretty much be about the early literacy skills, and then we're going to go into how language plays into that and development of language and speech milestones. So um, we'll have a short two-minute video at the end, and then we'll have some questions and time for discussion. So. Stacy, would you like to come get the microphone? Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. I'll flip slides. <laughs> Sounds great. Good evening. All right. Uh, do you have a copy of the handout? If you don't, you're welcome to go over and get one. Um, so I am Stacy Babish. I'm a reading specialist. And um, well, we're kind of switching gears. I'm in an elementary school at Greenville with Annie. And um, I think one of the things we need to think about um, is to. Being an elementary school teacher, we have to think about what happens before elementary school. So if you shift gears, a lot of you are already down there, but for me it is a little bit of shift, shifting down. But um, what we want to talk about is all those early years before they get to school. Um, I have two of my own daughters, so I feel like I've sat in an early parent or a preschool position before or have that perspective. And I remember thinking, what do I need to know? But we're going to go over tonight um, some things that we've picked out that are super important. So um, before they come to school, what is early literacy? What can you do at home? Um, early literacy is what they know, what they learn about books before they come to school. It's everything before conventional reading and writing instruction. Okay, so think about that. Well, think about even. They're watching you. There are so many things we're going to go over in our in our uh, presentation this evening. Um, at home, this is what early literacy looks like. It is. We put some pictures up here. The little the little girl. Well, I'll start with Amy's daughter. Amy's daughter is um, in the bottom right hand corner. That was Ryland, her daughter, but, um, and when she's she's in school, but you can see how she stacked the books around her like a teacher would, and she's reading to herself. And I think maybe there might be stuffed animals or something that she's circling around. But she's got those books, and she's modeling the reading. Above her, there's a baby that's babbling and looking at the pictures, and in the middle there, there's a parent snuggling with the child, reading a book, talking about the words, the pictures. Below, you'll see a drawing, and I think what's important is there's a, a writing that's attached to that drawing. So there's a string of letters. They're starting to recognize that words um, come together, and then um, to make letters come together to make a word. And then there's a girl that's in a looks like a preschool class. It's using her finger to go through sugar or go through jelly or something. Looks like maybe sand, and writing the letters, fingering modeling, writing the letters. Um, so this is what it looks like at home before school, before formal schooling. Why do we do this? Get in the Zoom. I'm out of 
the dessert. All right, there we go. Um, so why early literacy? Um, because it helps our children prepare for school. The skills your children learn before formal schooling has such an impact on how they're going to do once they get to school. I think that's really something important to realize, that everything you're doing these years before formal schooling really counts. They matter from day one. Um, students in kindergarten will be learning to read and write um, short word, or read, read words and short books. And there's so much more print. Um, the more print that they're exposed to, the better they're off their, they are. Um, the skills that they learn, those year, zero to five years, are so important um, to their growth for future, future um, success in school. What we know, yeah. What we know about early literacy development is that um, it begins early on at zero to three. It's not waiting till five till formal schooling begins. Um, early, early language development and literacy development is closely linked to the child's earliest experiences with books and stories. It's so important to give young children experiences with the books, get them in their hands, take them to story time at the library, visit the library, get books from the library, have a library card, um, Leave books around the house. I remember when my little girls, uh, my girls are now in middle school and high school. When they were little, we would just leave books and baskets all around the house. Um, and they even, you know, they pick out from mom and dad reading too. So they're watching parents. They're watching you read. So have a family drop everything and read time, what we call dear time. Um, drop everything and just sit down and everybody has a book in their hand and they're all reading. Get a book in her hand. There, see, she stopped crying. How awesome. <laughs> All right, so laying that foundation for, um, for reading and writing. Share your love of books. If you don't have a love of books, pretend. Look at those books in your hand. You know, we talk about um, square time. One of the books I've read before talks about square time and how we need to have positive square time. We get away from the iPad, get away from the TV, and put square books in your hands. Um, but that's the kind of that's the kind of thing we're looking for. Read to your child. Um, Use expression with your child. You know, make your voice go up and down. If it says roar, roar, you know, I remember reading dinosaur roar with your book. But make that voice go up and down. Um, when your children learn to um, read, they're coming to school ready. They know about books. They know how to sit and listen to a story. That is a big deal before they get to kindergarten for them to have those skills. Okay, so what can you do as a parent or as a teacher? Um, what can you do? What kind of behaviors are we um, looking for your child to be able to do once they get to kindergarten or once before school? What can they do? One of the things we're looking for is that they have some kind of print awareness um, that you can. Um, Amy's going to show it. We're going to model here. So we point to the front cover the back cover of the book, talk about what's on the front of the book. Look at the title, point out that there's an author, what does the author do? Talk about that there's an illustrator, what does the illustrator do? Um, teach them about directionality, how a book is held. I mean, see, there's, these are things that children don't know unless they're taught or they see you do. Um, start and teach them from left to right. So sweep your finger across the page. Um, and show them how it sweeps back. So you start at the top and you go across, and then where do we go from here? We sweep back and we continue on. So pointing to the words, letting them recognize that they're matching their voice to print is very important. Um, have your child um, maybe pronounce some of the words that you're pointing to. And in this picture here, you see the child that's pointing to the text. That's exactly the type of behavior we're looking for.
So more early reading behaviors. We're getting a little bit more academic. One of the things we're looking for when they get to school is um, we want them to recognize letters in the alphabet. So and especially the lowercase letters. We teach, they, they tend to know the uppercase letters and we forget about the lowercase ones. Um, so really focus on those lowercase letters. We want to be able to, um, we want your child to, a behavior is to hear and make sounds from the letters. We want to teach them about beginning sounds that ah, ah, apple starts with ah, ah, ah. We want to teach them about rhyming, the cat in the hat sat on a very fat, you know, just all that, those silly rhymes are taking their name um, and, uh, you know, turning it to a rhyme. Um, Jimmy Swimmy, Swimmy Jimmy, or Flappy, Flappy Happy, I don't know, or Larry, Larry Scary, Scary Larry. Um, but taking their name and then counting it into syllables. How many beats do you have in your, in your name? And um, one of the things we do in kindergarten is we take our finger and we'll say um, apple, and we'll say apple. And what I'm doing is I'm counting with my hand so the kids see that second syllable beat pop up. And you can, so you can start to show them how many beats do that does apple have? Um, pumpkin, pumpkin, or um, Thanksgiving, or Halloween, Halloween. You know, and they really start to hear those beats. These are all behaviors we want to start teaching them. We want to start teaching them about taking words apart. Base, ball, do you hear the two parts of that word? Or alliteration, um, the purple plastic purse. Or um, I know um, Peter McCory has that, um, I don't know if you've seen Peter McCory, he's a local uh, one-man band. Um, he often comes to the preschools and um, he's out at New Year's Eve at a site and um, he has a song about alliteration. And then also through books, we're teaching them, you want to teach them rare words, words that we don't necessarily speak. We're not usually speaking and saying once upon a time. Um, those are words that you're going to get from listening to stories being read to them. Um, and then we also want to talk about how do you retell a story in um, kindergarten and what we, what we teach our students at Greenville is um, a five finger retell. So your thumb is your um, all the cool characters. Who are the cool characters in the story? And then your pointer finger is where, where, where? Where did the story take place? Over there, over there, over there. So that's your setting. And then your big finger is the big problem in the story. What's the big problem? Then your ring finger is what led up to the big problem. Tell me some things that led up to the big problem. And then your pinky is how did the story end? So you're wrapping it all up. You teach your child um, that five finger retail, they're talking about the stories. That's just a, such a great reading behavior we really want to promote. What we're looking for when children have books in their hands, are they looking at the pictures? Do they gaze at the pictures? Are they noticing the red, um, the red duck, the red bird, the yellow duck? Um, I think of Arab Carl with those bright pictures. You talk about what color are they? What are those animals? Um, we look for behaviors which show recognition, uh, that they understand um, you know, their environment, these objects. We start teaching them. They don't need to go very far. I think you're in front of the public library right now, I think she left. But I saw a sign of read books or something about dreaming. You can go anywhere in a book, dream anywhere. And I thought, yeah, that's true. You can go anywhere when you open a book. There's so many different experiences you can promote. Oh, and Annie's holding up a book here with um, two kitties. So, um, white pictures. cat with realistic pictures. Yep. Yeah? The bird, the, the chicken, the dogs, the different colored dogs. They don't necessarily have to be around a dog to be able to experience these things, but to see them, the realistic, realistic pictures are really good. Um, All right, and we're looking for um, picture and story comprehension, which I kind of talked about with the five-finger retail. Behaviors that show a child's understanding of the pictures and events in the book, such as imitating an action scene in the picture or talking about the events in the story. 
That's what we're looking for in these type of behaviors. And this man here at his story time is just holding, you know, holding up that bear book and probably talking about what does the bear say, who's chasing, the, you know, who's chasing the bear, or who the bear is chasing. Um, but those are the type of conversations we want to be having with our books and children. <coughs> When children have books in their hands, we want to um, we want to just continue to teach them about that prince, the babbling that we were hearing earlier. You know, they're imitating you reading the story to them or listening to the story read, and talk about that finger running along the text. We want to start making them aware that voice is connected to the text. How can you incorporate literacy, early literacy, in your home? Or how can you get parents to, you're a teacher, and parents to include literacy in their, in their room? And I love this picture of the little girl in the upper left-hand corner. She's got that iPad. There are so many things, so many books you can read on as e-books now. And our public library has access to um, um, websites that will connect you for free to books. If you don't know about that, I think it's called Tumble Books. Is it Tumble Books? Um, they even have the animated versions of the book. It, the yeah. I was going to say, they even have on there the animated versions where you can pick a book and then it'll read it to you, pick the pages, and it'll do some animation for some of the characters in the book to keep them engaged. One of our kindergarten teachers today, I was just in there, and she um, had picked up, for St. Patrick's Day, had picked up a story that was read by um, puppets. Um, something about a leprechaun, leprechaun had lost its rainbow or colors, looking for, anyway, the kindergartners just loved it, but it was just that bringing that book to life experience. And in the middle here you see a little boy with audio, he's got the earphones on and the audio listening to the book being read to him. And in the sandbox you've got matching the, the, the child's interests and playing outside, playing with chucks. But hey, look, we also have a truck book, you know, really capturing their interest. And I love the little, on the, on the opposite side, the two boys are making a tent, you know, just really snuggling in and making reading fun at home, along with the girl up top, you know, reading to her baby doll. Um, you know, just again, modeling that language experience. All right. I'm going to switch over and talk about early language. So here's Annie. So now in her speech and language development, right? <laughs> um, so let's just talk a little bit about what I mean when I say language. Um, and language is obviously uh, oral language, meaning speaking language, is the foundation for early literacy development. You have to be able to listen and understand language, <coughs> speak language of your own, in order to gain these early literacy skills. Um, being playful in daily interactions and, and experiences with children make learning fun for them. It makes it engaging, and it encourages them to use their oral language skills throughout the day. Um, oral language involves speaking and listening. Um, it develops in infancy as it continues throughout their life. Um, oral language is essential for children to gain knowledge about the world, and it's critical for learning and thinking. Um, it starts from birth, just like early literacy. You talk to your baby. You talk to your baby in utero. You, you know, they, they are gaining vocabulary every day. Um, just a little bit on the importance of some of this. There's a few. I just want to cite a couple statistical things. Um, children who develop strong language skills during their preschool years create that important foundation for their later achievements in reading, especially with reading comprehension. We have so many students that. They might be able to read the sight words, or they might get the phonics skills, but then they can't remember what they read. They have a hard time recalling and giving you back that information. So establishing that early on from some of those strategies Stacy was sharing. And then children who lag behind their peers in language development are also children who would be at risk for reading difficulties once they get to school and start to learn those early reading skills. Once they get those alphabet letters and sounds down, those might be the children that would be at risk for having reading difficulties. So, yeah, yeah, um, and then also the vocabulary knowledge. Um, vocabulary is strongly related to reading proficiency and overall academic success. And like Stacy was talking about, the rare words that you hear when you're reading books, you don't always use those words or hear those words when you're speaking in daily communication. So using the the literature from the books, even just those simple children's books, 
gives them more and more vocabulary that they're just getting fed. Um, I wanted to give, I always like to just set sort of a baseline here so parents are aware of what we consider normal developmental milestones. So uh, this is just a very, very, very basic chart of from birth up to five years of sort of what we'd expect language development-wise. And it gives an example for each of those uh, age ranges. But the thing that I like to tell parents because it's easy to remember is there's the five, or the, there's like the, the age rule up to age five. Um, essentially, you want to see that your child is speaking in words about as many words together as they are old. So for example, your one-year-old is going to start using those single words and pointing to something and labeling it. Your two-year-old, two to three years old, should start stringing two words together. Want more? Want more? Um, or juice, please. Juice, please. Your three-year-old is going to start putting very simple three-word sentences together as they're you know, three getting ready to turn four. And then so on and so forth up to age five. Once you get to age five, you should have a pretty good language base to be stringing words together in whatever your native language is. Um, and we're not going to talk about dual language learners, but if you're learning two languages, it makes it a little bit more difficult. It's good, good, good in the long term, but it, it does make it a little bit more difficult in the beginning. Um, next slide. It, so that's language development. This is just a quick rep representation. The easiest way you can put it to show sound development in children. I get lots of questions from teachers, from parents, concerned, well, my child can't say that sound, my child can't make their R sound, my child can't make their S sound. So I always like to touch on this with parents as well. Again, this is the most simplistic way you can view it. The numbers being their age, and the letters within the numbers being the sounds we would expect them to be able to pronounce. more than girls with sounds in the general population. There are kids that can speak perfectly articulate when they're 18 months old, <laughs> but we have a large range of how these sounds develop. So this is just a guideline um, for that. Okay, and, and also this does not include like blends in words. For example, like the word glove has a GL, goal at the beginning. And those are later developing as well. Lots of young kids will leave those, like one of those sounds off. So um, again, just a general guideline. Alright, so we want to give you some ideas of how you can promote language development at home. Again, while you're always working on these literacy uh, literacy moments with your children at home, with your reading time, um, you're going to be using that language through everything you're doing with your child and modeling it constantly. Um, certainly talk to your child. Talk to them through everything that you do. I remember when my kids were little, and of course I'm a speech therapist, so I probably overdid it a little bit, but I just remember talking about everything I did when we, when we were making dinner. I literally said every step that we were doing, okay, I'm going to get the hamburger, and it, you know, I'm gonna put it in the. I'm gonna fry up the hamburger now. Can you hand me those tomatoes? I need the tomatoes. I mean, they probably got sick of hearing my voice, but you know, it, it fed them well <laughs> because they learned that language early on. Um, so talk to your child and everything that you're doing throughout the day. Um, that's one of the downfalls we see these days with all the electronics and advances in um, technology. So many kids get sucked into that. And while it is good in a lot of ways. If my kid's on the iPad at home, you better believe I'm talking to them and asking them what they're doing and they're feeding it right back to me while they're playing a game on it. So I don't just let them sit stagnant um, with that. Um, get on eye level with your kid. One of the best compliments I ever got from a parent in my earlier years when I first started, a little boy with autism, his mom came to me afterwards and she said, you know, Annie, I just appreciate so much how you communicate with my child because you're the only person that ever got down on his level and talked to him. And I, that just stuck with me forever. And I said, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's true. Kids appreciate you so much more. I mean, you don't need to stand over them and, you know, point the finger. Get down on their level. If they're on the floor on their bellies playing, get down and play with them on the floor on their bellies. If they're doing somersaults, do somersaults with them. Wherever your kid is, meet your kid at their level. Um, and then 
Uh, observe your child's attempts to communicate. Appreciate any attempt to communicate that they give you. So even if it is a behavioral, eh, say, well, I don't know why you're so mad about that. You need to use your words to tell me. Or if it's a, if it's a, an early on, like a one-year-old, two-year-old thing, juice. Oh, you're asking for juice. That's great. We'll go to the refrigerator and get some juice. Just build the language from what they're giving you. <clears throat> some more ideas that can just enhance your language experience. Go on a walk and talk. We do this at school on rain days. We call it, kids, my kids call it walkie-talkie. But <laughs> walk and talk around the bus loop. Um, go on a nature walk. Use your environment to just start labeling the vocabulary. Most of us as parents probably sort of do this already. But you know, you want to just keep keep their vocabulary building skills going. So walk and talk like an I spy game. Walk around your town, take your child um, and ask what's going on around them. Oh, you see there's dogs running over there. Oh, somebody's playing baseball. I wonder what they you know, I wonder what their team name is. You know, ask questions and make them be inquisitive about what they see. Um, playing follow the leader is great. Um, you're modeling action, verb, vocabulary words. You can say it while you're doing it. And they're also following directions at the same time, so they're listening and understanding what you say. They're showing you that they understand what you say. Um, food talk, again, like I said, when you're preparing food, when your child wants a snack, have them talk them through going and getting it and make them put it in a baggie themselves or put it on a plate themselves if they're able. Um, but, but talk about the food that they're eating and those experiences you have at home. Create shared experiences with your children. Um, recognize your child, what your child's interests are. And you see the picture of the dad and the boy, and they've got those Hot Wheel cars. That dad knows that that's what that little boy really likes to do. So he's going to use that as an opportunity to have communication exchange with him. Um, engage in those high interest activities like balls or wind up toys, balloons, bubbles. Bubbles are one of the best things ever invented. You can do anything in the world with a little tiny tube of bubbles. Uh, you can get, uh, it's amazing what I can get kids to do with bubbles. <laughs> Action words, vocabulary, up, down, side to side, what you're doing, pop, what you're doing, clap them out, poke them out, spot them out. Bubbles are great and cheap too. <laughs> um, and then again, acknowledge your child's subtle attempts to communicate. Um, scripted play is also good because it can help your child anticipate what will happen next and then wait for a response. So that would be you talking through the experience with your child. Um, daily routines. It, you see I did find a picture uh, up in the upper right hand corner. It shows morning routine, evening routine. I know even with my kids I had to, to set some standards for them. You know, most days, especially if you're a working parent and your kids go to school, you have a, a daily routine. Sometimes it's hard to get our kids to participate in those routines, especially in the morning or even in the evening. But if you have some kind of visual for them, even if you draw it out and have it on the refrigerator at the house, um, even if you don't have a visual, always talk them through it. Talk about all the things they need to do. And eventually, they'll start talking to you about it. Um, also add information. When your child says, just like I gave the example earlier, juice? Oh, you want juice. I want juice. We're going to go get some juice. Add to their language. Make their sentence expand even more. Whatever they give you, give it back to them plus a word. That's what the juice in the glass? Yeah, yes. Yeah, give them a choice. That's right. Um, and so, you know, imitate what they say and then add language to it to keep building their language and their vocabulary. All right, so we are going to kind of get into the last section of this, and what we're going to, what we're hoping to do is, again, we've talked about a lot of things you can do as parents or educators if you have these young children, but we want to talk about sort of the things that we're going to look for and what they're going to need to be ready for school when they enter. So, um, so uh, of course. You've heard me say vocabulary probably 30 times already. Vocabulary is it. The little I Spy book that I had over there. We have a picture up on here. They need to know everyday vocabulary. They need to know household items, outdoor environment, concept words. The concept words like in, on, under, over, beside, between. They need to know those words to be able to follow those simple directions when they get to kindergarten. Where do you put your backpack? On the hook. Um, verbs or action words, again, 
to follow directions, you need to know what you're, what what they're asking you to do. And then, of course, they need school-related vocabulary. Knowing what a cafeteria is is very helpful because <laughs> they're going to be in this big, loud environment with lots of kids. They might be a little overwhelmed. Hopefully, they'll see it ahead of time. But you know, library, gym, backpack, those are school-related words that a lot of kids don't come, come to school knowing what those mean. So introduce those to them ahead of time. Who lives? Ah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long day. Familiarity. OK, whatever. With books. No books, right? Be familiar with books. Um, read to your child. Get those books in their hands. Um, it also promotes the listening that, that they can go into a kindergarten class and know how to sit and listen to the whole story and know that there's a plot. Um, it teaches them about listening to learn um, so and asking questions about the story. So we talked about um, who was who were the characters in the story. That would be kind of an open-ended question. And the simple yes, no, did you like the story? Did you not like the story? What did you like about the story? What was your favorite part? Um, do, would you pick another ending of the story? And then looking at pictures in the book, talking about them. And then talking about um, question time means talk about um, get your child prepared for school by asking them questions. Ask them why. Why do they do this? How do they do this? Where do they do this? Um, get them to express their thoughts using that language. Um, look for the amount of information that they're sharing with you. Did they put it in the correct sequence? Um, and was it, did it make sense? Was it relevant to what you're talking about? If you're um, talking about the dinosaur, did they bring in a pot of gold? Or you know, was it relevant? And um, you know, it's funny, a side note, today I was do listening to a few children read at the end of our quarter. And I had a child read to me about a book about a boy. And then he made some random comment about the book. And I thought, he has no idea what this book was about. So be able to read the story and know what the plot was. That's super important. All right, one of the other things that your child is going to need need to have a, a decent grip on when they come to kindergarten, of course this is a developing skill for children, is to use sentences when they're speaking and to use correct grammar in their sentences. So you want to model that for your child in whatever your language is. Um, we have lots of children that come to school in kindergarten and speak fluently and say Spanish or in French or another language and that's totally fine. Just model the correct grammar in whatever language is in your home environment. Um, an English example of that would be if the child says, her riding, her riding bike, the parent would say, yeah, she is riding her bike. And then you know, you're kind of correcting that and you're agreeing with it at the same time. Um, ask your child to repeat after you the correct form, just like I modeled. And then you could say, she's riding the bike, like a question form. And then you praise your child for imitating it when they say it back to you. Um, again, any language you're speaking in the home, that would be important. And just, you know, there's so many different dialects, especially in English. We speak, you know, a southern dialect, and maybe we use a little bit different words in our, in our speaking. And um, I think the, the thing that we need to note is that when we're using literacy and reading, you know, when you, you're, you're getting correct grammar modeled in those books. So if they're getting that exposure, they know what... What, what we're looking for, and they're picking up on that. Um, but what I really like is when you get a good author who likes to put a lot of voice in a book and do those funny funny words, and, and you're reading that, and your child might kind of look at you like, why are you reading the book like that? Just like, I can't help but read Beatrix Potter without a British accent. I just can't do it. I have to read it with a British accent. And they kind of give me that look like, why are you talking like that? Because it goes with the story, right? Are yes. <laughs> and then um, also, the, it, of course, we know in kindergarten we work on rhyming. In preschool we work on rhyming. But like Stacy mentioned earlier, teaching your child to hear and clap out the syllables or the beats in the word. And then play rhyming games together. Um, you can see a picture of patty cake 
they're playing patty cake, and they're probably talking to a rhythm while they're doing it. Um, and then, you know, you can you can find lots of free uh, rhyming materials and cards. You can just Google it if you have internet access and find some things. But just think of words that rhyme together. When you're doing a walk and talk, find things that rhyme or find something and add on rhyming words to it. So you're listening to those and can making those connections with the familiar sound. Yes, we have a quick video we'd like to show you, and just a caveat. Do you want to click it on the thing, sure. and hopefully it'll come up? We we look through lots of videos, and we just thought we wanted to add a little something extra. There were a lot of them. There's even one from the Fairfax County uh, Library that was really good too. That was about five minutes long. It's not showing, Stacy. Hmm? It's not showing on the screen up here. Ooh. Anyway, little caveat for this is this is actually a Canadian video. It's not American made, sorry. <laughs> but um it, it, it perfectly explains some summarizes everything we were doing. I think you can have to put your Oscar Uh let's see. Minimize that. We just want this screen to show instead of the PowerPoint. Ta-da! Well, that was easy. Yeah, two screens. Next one. Next one. Don't drop that. You're blocking the thing. Babies and children okay. learn best when they have a strong attachment with their parent or a loving caregiver. You are your child's most important and first teacher. One of the best ways to build that attachment is to incorporate a regular story time into your daily routine. Speak to your baby, sing to your baby, and even touch your baby, make it a game. It's a learning experience, but for your baby, they are absolutely natural sponges. And the more stimulation and the more exciting, the more fun it is, the quicker they're going to learn, and you're going to benefit from that relationship you're establishing with your baby because that also fosters close ties. Books can also be a springboard for other kinds of language activities like telling stories and singing. So it's important to read sing, and sing with your baby every day. And even though you may not be the best singer, you may be out of tune, uh, your baby's not going to care about that. Your baby is going to love any time that you spend that one on one time singing to them and reading to them. So you can be as silly as you want. Uh, you can, you know, make up words, make up stories. Uh, but your baby's really going to enjoy that. Babies should bond to TVs. They need to bond with their parents. And so spend the time reading. It's more than just the communication piece. It's the tactile piece. It's the interaction with your baby. It's an improvement in the vocabulary and immediate feedback. We know lots of parents out there struggle with their own literacy issues and may have difficulty reading themselves. But you don't actually have to know how to read yourself. You can use your imagination. You can describe pictures to your baby. Just explaining to them uh, about nature. Those kinds of things are things that all parents can do. And the more you speak to your baby, spend one-on-one -on -one time talking to them, explaining things to them, the better that they are going to be when they, as they grow up, and uh, they'll be uh, better equipped then to start school. So the advice is start young. Just keep the kids away from the TV. Let them develop a love for reading. Will serve them well in their immediate development and quite candidly, be healthier for it. Hopefully, you were able to hear that. Did it come across? Okay. The link's Good. in your handout if you want to watch it. Yep, <laughs> on YouTube. So, speaking of the handout, Oh, I'm trying to figure out. Numbers. One. Let me do it. <laughs> okay, sorry. It won't let me turn it off. Just go back to this. 
and then get back to this. Okay. We just have a few handout things, I think. Okay. All right. All that for a video. <laughs> it was a good one, right? Um, so, well, I guess we just wanted to go over a couple things with you. Um, we have some handouts attached to the actual PowerPoint um, that's in your um, packet that you should have gotten. Um, and if you want to look through them, do you want to go over the reading list and the, the reach out and read? The, the websites that we got these from are in your handout as well on like the last slide or two. Um, and we also gave some, uh, you know, resources. There's, there's a few more videos we gave you a link to, too. Sorry. <laughs> there's a few more videos we gave you the links to, too, that we really, really like the information in them. We just didn't want to take the time to show them because they were probably about five to ten minutes long. Um, and then, again, some websites, if you would like more information, are listed in your handout there. And also, those websites are where we got some of our information from to present today. And then we did give some online activities, such as starfall.com, which is great for early literacy, um, and then abcmouse.com, which is one that you have to pay for, but it's phenomenal, and they do run specials where you can get like several months free. If you know a teacher friend, teachers can get free accounts, so if you need a spot, you can always email a teacher, and they can maybe put you on their account so you, you could get free access for your child to go on abcmouse.com. And then uh, the Jumpstart website, too. Lots of preschool-aged um, games that you can interact with your child there, too, just to get some more information from uh, the internet. Do you want to look at the handouts? Or? Um, we, the handouts that are attached there really just give you guys an idea of, again, some we already presented reading tips for the family. Um, we have a handout that talks about the milestones of early literacy development, so we're sort, of, sort of from like six months all the way up to five years to the kindergarten age. And then um, we give you a few, of, a few handouts that have to do with what, how, basically how you can do these things at home and, and just different examples of, of early reading literacy skills and some uh, ideas for activities based on the child's sort of age, developmentally where they're at. And then... I think the last one talks about language development. Yes, the last one is sort of a two—it's a two-pager, um, but it does again give you an idea of uh, a more detailed idea of some of the things that they should be developing along, um, eight, based on their age, um, where they're at, from three months all the way up through. So, um, JC and I are here. We both work at Greenville, and if you have any questions, you can always feel free to email us as well. I don't know if our emails in there. Um, Andy, I was just going to say my takeaway um, on those handouts, um, just don't wait. It happens before you get to school. And the more prepared they are, the more we can get their books in their hands, the more better off they're going to be. Because kindergarten, we hit the ground rolling, right? <laughs> we do. So don't wait. If there was a takeaway, don't wait. Just start literacy now, language and literacy. So, any questions? Anybody? Anybody want pizza? Lots of pizza out there. Questions? Oh, you want pizza? Oh, all right. <laughs> What's your question? So, how would you work on reading comprehension with early readers for starting to read themselves? How do they then struggle with? Yeah, put it on there. Do you mean kids? Do you do you mean children who aren't? Like, who are so young they're not really speaking yet to no, tell you? No, no. Oh. no I know someone who's learning how to read. Okay. But because it's so slow and kind of chunked, he doesn't like, really remember then like, what actually happened. Reading specialist. <laughs> 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 so I'm just jumping at the bit to try to answer that for you. Um, they're spending so much time working on decoding that that is very typical. Um, in fact, I can't tell you how many readers today I'm listening to and you get to the end and you say, okay, tell me what you know. And they look at you like, not much. <laughs> um, and that's okay. That's okay. But what you can do is go back. One of the things we don't do enough of is go back and reread. Don't just read it once. Go back and reread it again. Read it again. And the more times they see the text, the more times he connects, the more times he finger points, um, the more he's going to make those connections and it will start to stick and then start talking about comprehension. Comprehension is kind of the second stage. We want to read it first. 
know what's going on. So go back. I'd say that my answer to your question is um, go back and reread. Christy was actually one of my professors at UVA. So did I answer that question right? <laughs> did I pass? <laughs> How many years ago was that? <laughs> so, yeah, too many. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't worry about the comprehension right off the bat. Get them reading fluently, go back and reread and connect. Make sure you're connecting that text. And then the more you read it. And you can also, one of the things you could do is variate um, your voice. Say, you know, you've got that down in your normal voice, but can you say to Santa Claus, ho, 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 once upon a time? You have to use a funny voice. Can you use it in the house voice? Um, you know, different, so different expressions, different voice, change your voice around um, and track that print. I just want to add to that. Earlier readers who are listening to you read to them, the comprehension piece would be pointing to the pictures in the book. Yep. So saying, can you find the mouse? Where's the mouse on this page? And then they have to love scan and find it. Or if they're starting to recognize letters, I see a letter A on this page. Can you find the letter A? And then they have to point and find it. So those would be some early comprehension. But you know, obviously, if they're starting to read and decode, then you got a little while to wait. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me now, how old? How old? Five. Oh, okay. Next year, kindergarten? Yay! Greenville? No. <laughs> Where? <laughs> From the. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's a good school. <laughs> Does anybody else have any other questions? <laughs> okay. Sure. Yeah. So. All right, I'm always very mnemonic. I need my hand to kind of figure it out. So I kind of go, you know, like, can you give me the five finger retail? And um, so think about cool characters. Hey, Fonzie, cool characters. Who are all the cool characters in the story? All right. Then point, 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 point. Where did the story take place? What's the setting? There, 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 there. And all I have to do now with, with the kids that I've been working with, I just start going like, and they're like, cool characters. Sitting, where did it take place? And then big finger. And I always put them and start putting them together. Because children start making connections like, oh, I can give you my big finger. So big finger, big problem. What's the big problem in the story? All right. Your um your ring finger is um tell me some details. Give me two details that led up to the big problem. So tell me two things. See if they can pick them out. And then your pinky is I think of like a little piggy. Yeah. Wrapped around, wrapped around your finger. Um, tell me the ending of the story. So there's your five finger retail. Um, if you Google it, you'll see there's hands and they do like who, what, why. You can, you can, if you just do five finger retail, you'll find that on the internet. Yeah. Any other questions? Questions? That. That's off topic. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> you can ask. Go ahead. <laughs> you are right in the target age for normal stuttering. Between the ages of three to five, children are explosively developing language and comprehension of language. And so their motor development hasn't quite caught up or their speaking ability hasn't quite caught up with the amount of information that's floating around in there and that they want to say. And so we will get a lot of kids between the ages of, I'd say, two to five, late two, getting ready to turn three, where that's happening and and parents come bring, bring their kids all the time. They're stuttering, they've got a stuttering problem. And then you look for the things like, if there's a real true stuttering problem, you're going to see a child who has lots of other neurological symptoms, like they're jerking or making jerky movements when they're talking. If it's just a simple repetition of a word, that's total normal development. And they, most children just work their way right through that as their motor development catches up with their knowledge in their brain. <laughs> Oh, it doesn't mean it'll last till five, but that's the age range where that explosion of development is happening. So I would give it a little while. You you want to look for things like like I said, you want to look for other triggers that would be happening if you're really seeing a true stuttering issue. You just have to be patient. I I don't encourage parents to stop their child. Stop stop. 
you know, a lot of parents do that. I encourage parents and teachers when this comes up with a lot of kindergartners, especially if they're in a new environment, they'll come in and they might be a little nervous about talking and have a little bit of a stutter because of that too. Just be very patient with them. They'll get it out. Let them, let them, let them get their point across. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good question. Go for it. Yes, ma'am. Um, can you make any suggestions for teaching um, letters and early reading to a child who seems to have a more auditory learning style? Oh, go to Andy's website. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it, with all of it, and there's probably a couple of schools in the county. Um, you can go to my website. I have something that I do with um, preschoolers and kindergartners. It's called Visual Phonics. It works. And so you're basically giving them a hand cue to go with the letter and the sound of the alphabet. If you have, if you have internet access, you could go to uh, you know how to access teachers' websites through the school website. I can give it to you at the end here. But anyways, long story short, I have a video that I made, and then there's also handouts in a PowerPoint like this that goes along with it. Uppercase, lowercase letter, a picture that starts with that sound, and then the hand motions. So for example, we'll go five fingers again, the five vowels. We'll go, A is a vowel. Long sound, A says A, A, A. And then short sound, A says A, A. Apple. <laughs> I didn't think about that one. But anyways, it goes through the whole alphabet. And even um, even for kindergartners that are learning those uh, early digraphs, like the CH, TH, SH, um, it's in there as well. So there's there's hand motions that you can do to teach them that. I have kids. A lot of tactile learners, too. Andy and I share kids a lot. Um, and they'll come to me, and I go, who taught you that? And it's like they're going to copy. And they're, you know, they yeah. know. They, they use it. They connect those the hand motions. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? I have a question, but also that was me as a child. I was a really auditory learner, and it was hard for me to connect. And songs helped me a lot in oh, using yeah. music with it, because that was something that would stick in my brain and really help me to understand um, making those connections. Um, I have a, I come from a long line of really early, early vocal, like, full sentences, complex vocabulary before they're two years old. And I have a 16-month-old who That's has already started <laughs> responding to us spelling words. You can have yes and no and doesn't want to make sounds. Do you have any kind of strategies for, I mean, we sing along with stuff. We're doing everything you're recommending. But do you have any strategies for encouraging Vocalization at that really young age. Your your response. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you feel like it's a behavioral thing? Like that? I'm, I'm just it's hard to tell. She's, she's very determined yeah. and kind of stubborn. So I was gonna say it sounds like it might be have a behavioral component. If it's something like a choice, giving a choice always helps at that young age, so that they have to choose and they have to verbalize what they want in order to get their choice. Um, when you said the you word, I think you use your word. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but you certainly don't want to cause meltdown either. So <laughs> I think um, I think at 16 months old, that's pretty. I mean, single words is what I would expect. But if she's responding to that, she she knows some single words, but she was like two seven last night. That must be for sure into it or something. I I would say you have to just withhold it until she she uses it and hear it. To the point where you know she, she's got it. Um, and you're, it, it's one of those situations, usually, with those kinds of kids where it gets a little worse before it gets better. You might have some behavior and then you'll work through it. Um, with my nonverbal kids or kids who aren't using language yet, it's always about making the choice. That's everything we do. You have to make the choice. If you don't make the choice, then we're just going to sit here. Okay. You have to make the choice. So. <laughs> I hope that at least answered it a little bit. When I was a band of people, I am able to survive a two-year-old child in London. The benefits are huge. Yeah. Sign language, language promotes language. Like you wouldn't believe. I use sign language with kids all day long, even if they don't even know what I'm doing. It's the gestural part of communication. Um, and they usually pick up on sign language because uh, it's not 
brain to mouth. It's just it's hand. It's more it's that motor development usually comes quicker and easier to them. Gestural language. So they uh, it, again, I would even pair it with the verbal language because it, it reiterates it emphasizes what you're saying. Yes. If you're not if you're not dealing with someone who's actually deaf and using sign language as their own primary mode of communication, definitely use your normal grammar, your normal uh, uh, language, because um, that's a whole different realm <laughs> when you're learning sign language as your only mode of communication. That's good. So yes, pair it with the language that you would normally say. Okay, that sounds like a reading question. <laughs> I'm chopping at the bit again. Um, so one of the things you could do is um, open up the book and just talk about maybe you read the book first and they listen and you watch and you model and then maybe the second time through go back and visit again. Visit it, visit it again, and leave out a word, and say, what is that word? What does, what does that C word? Does, you know, what letter does it start with? What sound does that start with? See if you can figure it. And then start remembering. Oh, that's cat. And then I see it again on the next page. So just start picking out words from text. We want to connect. The most important part is it's not about sight words. It's not about sitting here flashing cards. Nope. It's not what it's about. Research shows we don't want to just flash cards. We want to connect it to text. So you can you can find books with you know simple vocabulary and just lift those words off the page. You could put cat. If it's cat is in the book, take the cat out and put it on an index card. You can do it that way. But don't just pick random sites because it's not going to be connected enough. And um, research has shown that a student needs a child needs to see that word 13 times before it even starts to stick. 13 times in a connected text. Um, so it's it's not about you know drill and kill the sight, the sight words over and over again. We want to put it, the best part is to put them in connected text that you leave out a word if you can. And then just start building on that. We're looking for beginner readers would be great if they had about 50 words that they knew. A, the, D, go, all those beginner sight words. It, and also, I, I'm jumping in there. Books that have nursery rhymes, or like this is if you're yeah. happy and you know it, a yeah. song that they're yeah. familiar with. Connected to song. And then they're pointing to the word that they know, and you could point to those words that you're happy and you know it's not there. <coughs> Pan, and then you do the motions with it too, and then they can they can find those words more easily because it's already up here. And they already know it. You know, in, in this song, I think connecting to song is really important. I was gonna just say I have a middle schooler, an eighth grader, who works really, really, really hard in school. She has to study and memorize. But man, if you put that radio on, she knows, I sit next to her in the car, and she knows every word, every song. And it's just that connected text. It's hearing that rhyme. But it's you know, it's kind of just pointed out to me of like, we really need to get them to hear that language, hear that rhyming, hear that alliteration, get them playing with words. It's fun. You know, and, and I, I think, you know, I hear that a lot in, in kindergarten. Oh, we're we're coming home from school and we're sitting down for 30 minutes. You know, their attention spans about their age. So if they're five, their attention span is about five minutes, and then they got to move. Um, maybe you can get six minutes out of them. But um, you know, just keep it short and sweet and keep it fun. Books have to be fun. We don't go to the library and shh. We talk about books. You know, they roar in the lion. And just you know, really make that book and language come alive. And I think that's the biggest thing you need to do is, if if they come to school already with that drill and kill, it takes a really long time to get past that wall. We got to keep books you know wide open, make literacy just come alive. You know, and and I know I see some preschool teachers in here, but just this just that approach of keep it fun and happy. They don't know they're learning, and all of a sudden, wow, they've got this bank of words, and they can string them together, and they can put them in text. So it's fun. But yeah, just keep Would you it. like to be we're, in a reading class? <laughs> <laughs> we're the ones that know. She's going down the hall with Carolina kids like the five five bird. We're basically just happy if you know it, follow me. You know, like, happy when you know it, clap your hands. Happy when you know it, put your airplane wings out and fly on into class. You know, just 
really be, you know, be fun. But as they're going down the hallway, I, um, you know, doing that, I brought them into song, and they're hearing that language, and they're going in my classroom going, do, 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 and either their brain is activated, their body is activated, I know they're listening, I know they're paying attention, and when I get in there, they're already focused on me. So it's fun in their perspective, but that's, that's my point is keep it fun, keep it